podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the Calgary Flames end off the week with a big win over Winnipeg, and they're back in the win column. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. Um, Matt, why don't we jump in and talk about the misery before we get to the good this week? What misery? None of the first three games this week happened. I don't know what you're talking about. You, it, don't you wish you could just have one of those things that the men in black have and just, you know, yeah. blank them from your memory? Well, it, frankly, it was like the same game three times in a row, so... Uh, yeah. <laughs> the Flames started a mini road trip this week, and actually started and ended a mini road trip this week. They went to uh, the East, and their first game of the week on Monday was a was a game against the New York Islanders. The Flames did pretty well here, left with one point, getting an OT loss against the Islanders. Um, I, I was surprised to see Connor Mackey in. Uh, you and I talked last week about how we thought he was done as a Calgary Flame, but he played here, and... Overall, the Flames played a much better game in this one. I hate to, I hate to ch- to go on about officiating, but I think that officiating really impacted the Flames game. Yeah, the the pl- play at the end of regulation with Zizekas hitting Markstrom, and then um, the Flames getting a penalty in overtime on the same generic type of play. It, it's just one of those where you you have to either call both or let both go and unfortunately they didn't and calgary ends up getting shafted a bit on that play and you know like full credit to the islanders they played well enough in the the latter st- half of the game to win um it's just you know you hate to see games that are decided by things that just aren't like quote unquote fair. Yeah. And I think, you know, the flames I thought played an okay game for most of this game. Um, but I, you know, I think with some of that officiating, uh, they, it's good. They got one point. Yeah. I, there's not really much you can do. Like if the referees are not consistent, like it, it makes the flames job a lot more difficult, but you know, uh, there really isn't much that you can do. The next night, Calgary went not too far away to New Jersey, playing the island or playing the Devils for the second time in a week. And surprisingly, Markstrom was in net again for both of the back-to-back games as the Calgary Flames took on the New Jersey Devils and the same fate as last time, lost to New Jersey uh, in regulation. What were your thoughts on this one, Matt? The Flames, uh, they got out to the early lead and the, then they slowed down. And the, the second period, they were not very good. They managed to tie it in the third and then took their foot off the gas again. And it seems like this team, uh, throughout the beginning of the season, like they they have enough skill and talent to get leads, but not the consistency to hold them. And they sit back far too much, and that allows the other team to get momentum and then turn it and pour it on. I thought the Flames had a really good first period here, and it probably should have been much more than uh, one nothing after the I first. agree. And I think that was the turning point of the game, that they didn't put two or three in. Because if they managed to get a second goal, I think that the second period is a different game. And I, I think that the Flames probably end up skating away with two points. But it just didn't happen that way and uh, yeah that's basically like the whole six game losing streak to that point it was pretty much the same story throughout each of the six games where the flames were good at a a certain point in the game eased off and lost and it it's like they have to learn that you have to actually follow through on the defensive side of things to go through the last 20 minutes properly in order to win. Yeah. I mean, you know, and we'll talk more about this uh, after we get through this week, but that's been the knock on the flames for a while is that they haven't been able to play a full 60. Mm -hmm. Um, We should note here that Jonathan Huberto was out of lineup for this one. A little bit confusing with, with this one, the Calgary Flames official statement was he was out with an upper body injury, yet Daryl Sutter said he couldn't get his foot into his skate in the morning, and somebody posted on Twitter that they saw him with a walking boot. So either he was injured top and bottom, or someone's playing some games here. 
it's uh, one of those body injuries. <laughs> you know, well, but that's why not, I'm surprised they would say upper. Yeah, that, like it, it's like yeah, he's hurt and everything. <laughs> you know, like it, it. Yeah, like I'm sure he had an upper body injury at the start uh, with because uh, like in the Vegas game he got hurt and he was looked like he was favoring his arm after getting hit at one point and. You know, it's quite possible that he subsequently, while playing, got his foot, like, broken or some other miscellaneous minor injury. Um, so. Well, and when I break that down and they say he couldn't get his foot in there, that doesn't necessarily mean his foot wouldn't fit. It could mean that he could not use his hands to keep the skate open. Yeah. Well, I mean, they have people to do that for you, but... Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, it's hard when... Yeah, you know, at least, uh, and the better thing is, is that the Flames have actually allowed him to sit out for a while and recuperate instead of uh, pulling another Sean Monahan, where, you know, he just stays in the lineup even though clearly fighting it. And, you know, the sooner that Huberto gets 100%, the better off that the team will be. Well, let's, uh, let's come back to him and let's finish talking about the week. The Calgary Flames played their last game of this short road trip against the Boston Bruins going to Boston. And this is where we saw Dan Vladar this week. The Calgary Flames dropped this one 3-1 to one to the Boston Bruins. What were your thoughts, man? Um, frankly, I thought that the team played well enough to win this game. Um, just... Yeah, you know, the goals that Boston scored, uh, Vladar couldn't really do anything with, and the offense just didn't click. And you know, if the Flames had gotten a bounce at some point, like they're generating lots of shots throughout each game, it's just that they're not getting any luck, and certain players are not being assertive enough, uh, like Manjapane, and uh, up until recently Lindholm have not been themselves and like we started to see Manjapane turn a little bit around in this game and definitely more so in the next one but it, it, the team just seems to be gripping the sticks too hard where like if they can just get a bounce to go their way then they'll be fine it's just that when you're having like basically all of your scoring lines having that same issue at the same time it makes games like this happen where you know, Calgary was able to go punch for punch with Boston. It's just, you know, they fell short. Well said. I don't really have anything to add to that. I thought Calgary looked like they were coming out of their losing streak in this one. And I think it was just unfortunate that they were trying to get back out of this against such a good team. Yeah. And realistically, like of the seven losses in a row, like the Flames probably could have won five or six of them if they had had favorable bounces or a timely save um like the effort levels in most of the games was there it's just you know one of those stretch it was a very bizarre seven game losing streak frankly like the flames i didn't think were like blown out in any of the games no i agree and then they ended it and they came back here for hockey night in canada and finally ended the the losing streak against the Winnipeg Jets Saturday night. Um, Tanev back in the lineup for this one. He was out for the whole road trip, and the Calgary Flames ended up winning three to two over the Jets to uh, well, end that end yeah. that losing streak. You see, the reason why the Flames had that long losing streak was it's all Rick Ball's fault. <laughs> That's who you're blaming it on. Okay. Yep. Yeah. You know, I- I'm glad to see that he's better and back in the booth and, you know, glad that he is okay after the pulmonary embolism and all that. Um, but, yeah, it was his first game back in uh, the broadcast booth on Saturday, and that was definitely nice to hear. Um, and the team just seemed to buckle down uh, more so in the third period. Like, I thought they got really sloppy, frankly, in the second period again, and I was very worried that it was going to be a repeat performance of the past seven games. Uh, but in the third period, they actually 
paid attention to details, and Winnipeg really did not get a single thing going throughout the entire 20 minutes. Yeah, I think that's a good way to look at it. Um, I, I thought, yeah, I thought the Flames came into this one, and maybe, you know, maybe it says something about Tanev's importance this team, but they just seemed, especially the defensemen, they just seemed more collected in this one with Tanev back on the ice. They, even from the from the opening puck drop, this team just seemed like they were ready to go. Well, how would you say, um, a lot of, like, what the Flames' problem thus far has been is just lack of confidence in themselves and each other and like due to the fact that like so many players have swapped out and like the lines are all switched up uh, it's hard for guys to find chemistry and like go to areas where you know that the puck's coming and you just have to have your stick on the ice and ready to shoot now like everybody's having to learn new ways of doing things and it hasn't gotten instinctual yet but it it in this game and the last couple you're starting to see more of that coming out and like Elias Lindholm for example uh was deadly out there and had three or four good chances in the game to score had a goal and an assist uh, Manjapane had a few good chances and he's looking more like himself and but whether it's the defense or the forwards like everybody just seems a little off and like you can even look at Mackenzie Weger like he never played this poorly last season with Florida but he's still adjusting to the new team and teammates and system and it's just one of those where like it's starting to look like all the parts are getting towards being in the right order it's just not quite there yet but well, good to see a big uh, flames win especially with huberto still out of lineup here um and you know the fact that they we were able to pull this off that seven game uh losing streak did you know this matt is the longest losing streak for daryl sutter coach team that wouldn't surprise me um it's one of those uh, it, like, it was a very bizarre losing streak. Like, I don't recall ever seeing a team have a seven-game losing streak where for most of each of the games, they were the better team, and or at least on par with their opponents. Like, usually if you're losing that many in a row, like, things have gone off the rails, but, like, I never really felt that, even though, like, the results ended up being the same. And it just looked more of like a process issue and uh, a lack of attention to details and positioning and like that kind of thing. Um, like how we were critiquing Connor Mackey last week um, in the devil's game. And it's one of those things where the team just, it, it's starting to mesh a little better, but you know, it's just a very weird stretch of games. Before we move away from this Winnipeg game, uh, should be noted Blake Coleman has been assessed a five thousand dollar fine after that game for his slew foot on Pierre Luc Dubois. I didn't think it was all that bad. I don't think it's five thousand no. dollar fine worthy. No, and frankly, um, with that uh, Markstrom penalty to put the Flames down five on three, uh, I I don't know about you, but to me, like Dubois should be skating away happy that he didn't get a blocker to the face on that play. Like, uh, you know, like if you're skating in after the whistle and you bump the goalie, you know, getting tripped is like the least bad thing that could happen to you <laughs> in my mind. I agree. And like, I don't understand how the goaltender didn't got the penalty when he was interfered with by somebody else. Like, that's literally a goaltender interference penalty and yet the goaltender got the penalty and it's just a, a very mystifying call yeah I, I agree that that one confuses me well matt uh that wraps up the flames week the three losses and a win the flames now after the after that week sit fifth in the pacific division they've played the least number of games in the pacific division with 14 and right now they're six six and two so six wins six losses two overtime losses for a total of 14 points which puts them at 500 um and they are behind edmonton who has 18 points seattle has 18 points la who has 21 and vegas who has 26 so as of right now sitting outside of a playoff picture 
And that brings me to my next question. And something I've been thinking a lot about since, uh, you know, since this losing streak finished last night, has the Flames losing streak done anything to your outlook of their ability to be contenders this year? Uh, not in the slightest. Like, frankly, looking at the schedule to start the Flames season uh, to this point in the year, uh, if you had said to me that the Flames are 6-6-2, six, six, and two, I'd be like, yeah, that's about right. Um, like, they've played a lot of really dynamite teams, and while it was disappointing to be 5-1 and one at one point and now being 6-6-2, six, six, and two, in context, like, the Flames have had a, a lot of growing pains over the last month and a half, and... Like, you're starting to see guys starting to come out of those growing pains. And, like, other than the Buffalo game at the beginning of the year, like, the, the Flames have, even in their losses for good portions of each of the games, have looked like the better team, even if they are on the losing end. And, like, you look at their defense, like, other than uh, Seattle, uh, the Flames have surrendered the fewest goals, and Vegas uh, have surrendered the fewest goals in our division. And, like, that's with all of this turmoil. And it's one of those things that, you know, like, the Flames have also scored the fewest goals of any team in our division, and, like, that won't continue either. Uh, the, so it, it's one of those that, Looking at the team, you know, like, it, it reminds me of, like, when baseball teams, like, bad baseball teams will have a a good stretch and, like, everybody's like, oh, wow, they're good now. And then they slowly return to the mean. The Flames are on, I think, the other end of that where, like, their struggles have been overblown. And I think that their talent level is going to return them to the mean, which in this case means like further way further up the standings and it's just more of a matter of time for this to get sorted out uh rather than it being a persistent issue yeah i think and you mentioned it earlier the weird thing about this losing streak is the flames did not play bad hockey like they i wouldn't say they played their best hockey by any means no but they they definitely didn't they didn't go out, and we've seen seven-game losing streaks in this team. We've seen six-game losing streaks where they look terrible. Oh, yeah, and they it's did, like, uh, do you even know what here. end of the hockey stick is up at <laughs> certain points? But, like, there was none of that um, during And I think streak. that says a lot about this team and where they're at. And, you know, I does it change my outlook? Right now, it doesn't. I think if they can't put a streak together here or keep the wins going... I maybe at a sudden we revisit next week, but I think as long as they don't lose more than about three or four in a row for the rest of the season, it doesn't to me. I think well, every team goes through rough patches. Yeah, and you have to look at the Flames' quality of opponents. The Flames have had by far the toughest schedule of any team in the NHL. Like, there's not even anyone remotely close as well, um, which, like, pretty much the Flames' schedule through Christmas is you know, a gauntlet of hell, basically, where it's all good teams pretty much all the time. And then, it, you know, about a third of the rest of the games after that point are against good teams, and it's you, you're starting to see the Anaheims and San Jose's and Arizona's after Christmas. And, you know, it's one of those, like, the Flames really haven't had any true balance in their schedule like, even the three-game road trip, uh, you know, you played the best team in the uh, Metro Division, you played the best team in the Atlantic, and you played the the second best team in the Metro. Well, none of those games were pushovers, even though all three were one-goal games, and, uh, well, the empty netter in the Boston game, but, like, functionally, all three were one-goal games, and yet you're going up against, like, three of the best teams in the NHL, and it's... You know, in context, like if they had been playing, say, Montreal and Columbus instead of New Jersey and Boston, like they probably win those games. And even if you change nothing else about how the Flames are playing. So it, it's just one of those where it, kind of like the circumstances. The perfect and, storm. Yeah. Like all of everything. Like you have a bunch of new people that are adjusting to each other and 
a, a new system for a bunch of people and just enough of everything to be going a little sideways, but not overly so. And it just culminating in a seven game losing streak. But you, you even look at other teams like um, Washington and Pittsburgh are doing terribly this year. Tampa Bay is awful. Um, St. Louis is like five and eight, which makes no sense for how good they are. So it, it's not like Calgary is the only team that's off to an abysmal start for where expectations were. But I think in each of those cases that that will correct itself as the season wears on. Yeah. And, and you know, we've had, well, I mean, we, we talked about this last week, two call up defensemen, Tanev out, Huberto out. Like, I think this has been a lot of just the perfect storm for the flames to bring all this together. But the fact that they didn't look bad coming out of this and the fact that they managed to battle through it, I think, like I said, says something about this team. And the fact that they didn't seem to get frustrated. Like, how often have we seen, you know, a team, whether it's the previous iterations of Flames or other teams, where they come into this, they start losing, and then they just start to, you know, look like they're desperate or they're disengaging or a few different things that happen there. Like, the Flames didn't. And while I don't think it's the game they wanted... They went out and they played their game every night. Yeah, and like you take the Winnipeg game. I I did not think that at any point the Flames played desperate hockey. And, you no. know, they just played their game. They got the good bounce in the first with uh, the Lindholm goal. They made a good play with the Rajitska goal, a good effort goal by Lewis. And, but, like... All of the rest of the play was the same process, and they just were executing their game plan. And that's more of like the expectation, just with more bounces going our way as players are more confident and assertive. Well, and I don't think that the game they played is the game they want to be playing. Like, I think we could pick apart each one of those games and say there's things that need oh, to yeah. be improved, but. They played, you know, some semblance of their game, which I think is not always the case, especially for the Calgary Flames when they get down. Oh, no. And, and like, frankly, like, if they had been playing slightly inferior opponents through the seven-game losing streak, like, the the only uh, quote-unquote easy game in the losing streak was the Nashville game uh, based on current standings. And even then, Nashville has a lot of good weapons at their disposal and Calgary just couldn't do their thing that game. And, but like all of the other six opponents have been playing really well to start the year. So it's, you know, it, it one of those damned if you do damned if you don't, but it, you know, it, at the end of the day, it's not, they're, they're at 500 and you know, like basically everything went wrong and they're at 500. Yeah, well, and they got that early win streak, and that really helped. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask, if we look at the Flames now after 14 games, and let's maybe specifically focus on that seven-game losing streak, what is a positive and a negative that we learned about the Flames over that streak? Uh, the main positive is that even if um, things aren't going their way, they are still playing a hard-nosed game throughout, and... You know, like, it is disconcerting with, like, all the late game, you know, surrendering multi-goal leads and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, like, obviously not how Daryl would ever draw that up. But, you know, like, even when they're not being successful, they're still in it. You know, and the downside is that... Like a whole bunch of Flames players have to, in very short order, figure out their stuff so that way they can hopefully turn it around for the, the upcoming six-game road trip, which is another murderer's row of really dynamite teams. I would say, for me, the positive we took out of it was, and we, uh, we just talked about this, but that the Flames were able to play their game even as the mount, the losses mount. And I think that says something about the veteran nature of the team that they're putting out there, that these guys are able to go out and do their job even when the going gets tough. 
-hmm. The negatives, I think, I really think that this, especially this road trip, exposed some of the Flames' weaknesses in the lineup. And I think that there's still, and we've talked about this, we won't rehash it all this week, but I think that there's still some work to be done to shore up this lineup. Oh, yeah. And you can even see, uh, like, on the defensive side, like, Mackenzie Weger, for example, has not played uh, as well as he normally does. And when you look back in years, like when Dougie Hamilton first arrived, he played poorly for the first two months of the season before he got comfortable. Noah Hannafin played kind of mediocre for the first 30 or so games, and then he turned it around. And Uyghur is basically in that zone. And like it's like all the new guys other than Kadri. It, like they haven't figured out how to be themselves yet on the, this team. And that needs to hopefully accelerate as we move on. Well, Matt, I know that, you know, the new guys are getting some flack there, but I know that uh, 55 and four Hannafin and Anderson have also been getting some flack. I thought that Winnipeg game was probably the best game for at least Hannafin this year. Yeah. I, I think that those two are the least of our problems. I'm seeing a yeah. lot of, people talking about them online and not being happy with them. But I think those guys are doing what they need to be doing. Could yeah, they do I, better? I sure. Agree. But yeah, but they're not doing bad. Yeah, no, I think um, everybody could be doing better. It, how would you say, um, not to like deflect blame off of the defense. Cause like they have to get better, but the forwards have also been like blowing assignments a lot more than normal. And for any team, any defense pair, like if you're not getting assistance from the forwards, like it makes your job a lot more difficult and it makes it very much more like when anything does go wrong, it looks more like it's the fault of the defenseman. And Hannafin and Anderson have slightly been worse than they were last year, but it, it's... One of those, I, I think that, like, as the, everybody gets on the same page, the team itself will be better. It's just, you know, and all the individuals, it's just one of those where everything's kind of not in the right place right at the right time. And, you know, and we, we've even seen that with Markstrom. Like, his timing for saves has been off for the first month or so. And yet, in the Winnipeg game, he made that really nice save in the first period and looked solid throughout and looked more like the marks from we're used to. So I think it's just a matter of time, frankly, for everybody to get through everything. Well, a guy who's been a benefit of timing is Adam Rajichka. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he's a guy who didn't play a lot to start this season. When Huberto went out, I kind of expected he would slot in on the fourth line, but no. He's gone right to the top. Um, Lindholm to Foley, Ruzhishka has been our top line. And that Winnipeg game, he got two points. So having a, a good night there. You and I have talked a lot about the forward depth and some of the challenges this team has had. Do you think we can look at this and say, well, we solved that forward depth issue with Ruzhishka? Well, like even when like we first met Ruzhishka right after he was drafted, like the skill level that he had and the, like the reason why we drafted him like the skill level was there it was always more a consistency and effort level kind of issue with him and it, you know like the talent is there and like he does have the talent to be a top six forward it's just you know he has to apply that every game and it's like great you had an awesome game against the Winnipeg Jets repeat that against LA and you don't necessarily need to score points, although that would be ideal, but just be that presence on the first line, go and forecheck and, you know, create more space for Lindholm and to fully. And if you can do that with any consistency, like you're going to get your points, you're going to get assists on setting up the other guys because uh, both to fully and Lindholm are good scorers. So it, like, if Ruzhitska wants to be a high-quality player in the NHL, like, he really needs to take this at, at baton and run with it. And, you know, it it's on him. One of the knocks on him since he's been a player in junior has been that he has all the tools. He just doesn't bring his tool belt every night. 
And inconsistency, I think, is a big reason why he got drafted where he did in the draft. I mean, you know, he wasn't a top pick. I'd have to look at his exact... Fourth uh, round. That's what I thought. I was going to say either third or fourth. Yeah. But, you know, I, I think you're right. Rajishka has been handed a great opportunity. It's up to him if he if he runs with it or not. I don't think that he's the top six replacement we need. Not this year, anyways. I think he's still probably... I think you could look good or I could look good on a line with Lindholm and DeFoley. I think he's still probably a, a bottom six guy this year, but I think it's good to get another guy going. Well, and th- that's one of those where chemistry also helps. And like, he does seem to have an innate chemistry with Lindholm and DeFoley. Thus- and Daryl mentioned something after the Winnipeg game about uh, Lindholm really liking him. Yeah. And it's one of those where, um, cause Rajitska is very good at um, getting the pucks uh, behind the net and uh, whether it's pushing off the defender or just using his very big size to like poke the puck off of the fender stick or use his body in whatever way. And he can make quality passes and both Lindholm and uh, Toffoli are more the types of guys that need to receive the puck from the guy behind the net. And, like, we saw that a lot last year where Gaudreau would have the puck behind the net and feed it out to Lindholm for the one-timer. And, like, uh, you you can re- replay that goal, like, 25 times last year in your head just from, like, all the times it happened. And, you know, if uh, Rajitska can apply his skill set properly... And with any sort of consistency, he could find himself in a niche where, like, is he a top six forward? Probably not, but he might masquerade as one rather effectively if he can play his cards right. And, you know, if he can do the job well enough with his line mates, even if he is being quote unquote carried by them to an extent, you know, that also just takes a huge problem off the flames hands and then you can redeploy huberdo on a different line and you know take advantage from him being on a different line entirely and we'll talk about what lines they use today on sunday at practice a little bit later and where huberdo fit into that but i understand what you're saying about chemistry but at the same time if i'm looking at this team as a contender adam rajishka is not your top line winger no, and I mean it, every other team say, that's been a, a a contender for the last you know th- four, five, six years has had a full line of first line players at least. And it's one of those things where, um, like if Rujitska can prove that he's worthy, then by all means, you know, run with him. But you know, like odds are he's going to fade at some point. Uh, you know, just because the nature of younger players is to trying to establish themselves. And, you know, sometimes things do click. And, you know, like we saw Andre Palat in Tampa Bay, he got an opportunity in the top six when he was kind of just a borderline player. And he's, you know, a multi Stanley Cup champion, 20 plus goal scorer over a number of years. And, you know, like he was a seventh round draft pick. So like, it's one of those that you're not really sure yet, but definitely something to keep an eye on. And it, it like, how would you say when it comes to the trade deadline, I'm already like pretty much in pen writing that the flames are going to acquire a good top nine forward. It's just, you know, with how everybody plays it'll depend on what level of guy and like if Rajitska can be passable that's one thing if not that's another and go from there right now when I look at this lineup I guess you know longer term than this week or this month even as you mentioned trade deadline or next year I think the Rajitska and Dubé are probably competing for the same spot yeah I agree and I think that, you know, when we look at the deadline or when we look next year, one of those guys will get that spot. The other probably won't be here. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, it, and we're both, I, I'm figuring, thinking the uh, winger to Backlund Coleman on the third line for that spot. 
Yeah, I think both those guys are third line players. I mean, if we look at it, yeah, you know, Dubé's been used in the second line. I think as we've talked about, that's a depth issue. But I think both those guys top out of the third line winger. Mm -hmm. I agree. So that's that's kind of my thought is it's just a matter of if and I think right now Dubé has been the more consistent of the two. But I think if if Rajichka can figure out how to do that, I think that, you know, it's going to be a toss up of at that point. I think it's whoever you get more for is the one you move. Hmm. Uh, yeah. And uh, it just depends uh, at the time, whatever, whatever. Uh, and uh, I would not be surprised if one of those guys wasn't included in the trade to get said top six forward even could be um we'll see one thing I, I don't i don't think you want to take yeah we'll, we'll see i don't know if they'd want to take nhl players off the roster right now but i could see it yeah uh one thing i wanted to ask you um matthew phillips being the leading scorer in the ahl do you give him a shot if you're going to give someone a shot from the AHL, and I talked about this with our friend Kevin on Shifts and Pucks uh, this week, I think Phillips is the guy. I don't think you bring up Peltier. I don't think you bring up Zari. I don't think you bring up some of these other people that the fans want to see. Phillips is 24. He's at that point where you got to see what you got at the NHL level. And I think if you're going to bring somebody up, at least to give them a shot, say, well, you know, you have an injury or just to put someone in there, I think it's Phillips. I don't think Phillips is the solve for this year. But I think you he's the guy. He had a great season last year. He's having a great season this year. I think he's the guy you got to give a look to right now. Yeah, I agree. And it's one of those where, like, uh, when uh, Cliff Fletcher uh, was uh, managing the team back in 89, uh, Theo Fleury had a ridiculous season as a uh, rookie in the uh, minors. And he had, like, 50 goals in 39 games in the um with uh utah or whatever and uh when they recalled flurry up to the flames uh basically said you know if you get hurt that's kind of your problem (laughs) and i think that the flames kind of just have to say well phillips is tiny and you know like being five foot six and 130 pounds or whatever you know he's listed at yeah, he, he's a very small player, but, you know, if you want to be an NHL player, um, you know, you're going to have to know how to not, you know, get creamed by NHL players. And and it, it's a very different game today. I, I think if you bring him up, you have to manage that and make sure he's not getting hit, especially because you need him for the Wranglers. Yeah. So I could even see him being put on a line with Lewis or Lucic, a little bit of a a policeman for him. Yeah. And it's one of those where, you know, you have to see like, can he do what he's doing in uh, the AHL in the NHL level? Cause like his skill set, he is looking like a guy, like a Jake Gensel caliber guy, but will that actually translate into the NHL? you literally won't know until you actually throw him in the lineup. And, you know, would I expect him to be more than a third, fourth line guy than, and like used on the power play? No, but you know, you have to see what you have there. And like in the preseason, he set up that really nice goal with uh, Michael stone in overtime. And, you know, he's done basically everything that you could ever want in the AHL. So it's one of those where, you know, and he's a group six UFA at the end of the year. So whether he's going to get a shot with us or somebody else, like it's going to happen soon. And, you know, like I'd hate to see a really dynamite scorer get wasted just because, oh, he's small. I have a couple thoughts on that. I think you nailed it. I think he's probably a third line guy if we look at his upside i don't think he's the solve for the flames depth problems by any means but i think you know maybe a better option than some of the guys who are currently in our lineup so i think he definitely needs a shot um jake gensel's an interesting comparison i think in my heart he's going to be one of these guys we see who's better than the ahl not quite good enough for the nhl and I, I I think he could totally end up being agree. a career th- he could end up being a career thirteenth forward. 
Yeah, and I and there's a good agree. living to be made doing that. Yeah, I agree with you. I don't know as if he would be able to cut it at the NHL level, but you kind of have to let him at least give him an opportunity. And you know, like he'll either sink or he'll swim, and it'll become readily apparent after a couple of games whether you know there's anything there there or if he's just. You know, like Sonny Milano was in the preseason where it's like, and this guy doesn't really fit. So, we'll see. I, I just, I, I would hate to see, you know, a guy with higher upside, if, you know, he can translate it, you know, walk away for nothing just because, oh, he's short. You know, like, as you said, the NHL is a different landscape than it was. Like, there literally would be no way he'd be still playing hockey at this point if uh, we were talking 30 years ago. It's true. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, if I look at this lineup right now and I look at who do you take out to put him in now that Huberto's healthy, and we'll talk more about Huberto in just a minute, I think Lewis or Richie comes out. Like That's really the only the only way you can slot him in. And, and Lewis has been playing third-line wing, so that makes sense. Yeah. And yeah, you know, it, it's one of those where you just try it for a few games, and and I I wouldn't be in a rush to do this. Like I'd probably be like more like say uh, d just end of December January uh, to give you know let Phillips like kick some butt the rat for another month or so just to like prove that yeah he is really kicking some butt in the AHL, and then if the like stock net a bit of a. a trouble getting started so i think getting them down there to get that team going is important too mm -hmm. you know yeah. and i i i wouldn't have been surprised the flames want him actually here this week if if uh huberto was out but um they didn't have the cap room i mean with with the two defensemen they brought up they had six hundred thousand and minimum contracts are 750 right now so even if they wanted to they couldn't have brought him up and i wonder if that was part of the reason we didn't see him at least on the road with these guys yeah, wouldn't be surprised. And uh, with the Flames sending uh, Dennis Gilbert back down, uh, you know, <coughs> it really depends on uh, the duration of which uh, Huberdeau is out. Like, if he's back tomorrow, then, you know, there's literally no need urgently to bring Phillips up. Well, let's talk about that. Dennis Gilbert came up for two games. Uh, he's been sent down now that Tanev is healthy. Gilbert played two games for the Flames during his recall. He registered zero points and was a minus one and got into a fight in New Jersey in his Flames debut. If you talk to anyone who watches the Wranglers, they'd say that he's a solid but unimpressive uh, defenseman. And I think that's what you need from him at the AHL level. And that's what you got at the NHL level, too. He was good enough. He gave the Flames acceptable minutes. Um, you know, he's a, a bottom pair guy that he didn't screw up. And I think that's the important thing there. And I think that's how you get another recall um, down the road, but Daryl Sutter did say that the pairing of him and D Simone let in too many goals or sorry, they were on the ice for too many goals against. So that to me, though, is what you expect when you have a, a pair of call-ups. Yeah. Like, you're kind of in, uh, please don't screw up mode <laughs> when those guys are on the ice. And it, you know, when you're talking like your ninth and 10th defenseman, you know, literally, what do you do? You know, like, those guys are your ninth and 10th defenseman for a reason, and... You're... And I would even I would even say Malosh is probably above them on the depth chart, but he costs more to recall. I agree. So with Gilbert's recall to the AHL, that drops the Flames to 22 active players, essentially making room for the Flames to activate Michael Stone from the IR when he's ready. They're currently carrying 13 forwards, 7 defensemen, um, and that now puts them below the daily cap limit, which means they can start to accumulate cap savings for future usage. So whether this is a paper thing and Gilbert will be back, I don't think he will be at this point until they you know, need a recall. And even then, again, I don't think he'll be the first guy to get that call. Yeah. But, you know, I think he did what you expect from a guy in his position getting recalled. He gave perfectly adequate NHL minutes. Yep. Uh, anytime you have like a 14th or 15th forward, you know, it's sort of like Walker Dewar last year who played a couple of games and he was okay. Not great, not bad, just there. 
you know yep cool <laughs> and like that's all you need and from that player in that position and you know the flames weren't needing them to be more than you're a warm body that's not hurt and you know you can and, play and not going to give us negative outcomes when you're on the ice yeah and I guess the other big news talking about, you know, recalls and injuries and that sort of thing is Huberto was back on the ice Sunday today, as we record. Um, he says that he's ready to go Monday against LA. Interestingly, he was put on a line with Backlund and Lewis. So Matt, let me read you the practice lines that we saw today. Okay. Line one, as we expect, is Rajishka Lindholm to Foley. Line two is Lucic, Kadri, and Mangiapani. We've seen that before. Line three, Huberto, Backlund, and Lewis. Line four, Coleman, Dubé, Ritchie with Rooney as the extra forward. I don't mind those lines. To me, if you got, and I mean, maybe you put Coleman on the third line for one game just because you're trying to limit his minutes, but, or sorry, Huberto on, a, on the third line, I mean, as you limit his minutes, but Huberto is not a third line guy. And I think, I think, I think you keep Rajichka, Lindholm to Foley together because they've looked good. And we talked about Rajichka earlier. I think you end up moving Huberto, Kadri, and Mangiapane together as your second line in that case. And then drop Lucic down with Backlund and Lewis. Yeah. How would you say with Lu uh, Lucic, uh, he has been one of the Flames' more effective players this season. And has looked really good uh, for large stretches of time. Uh, he still makes mistakes because, you know, like, but it, it, he is looking a lot more effective overall on the ice. So him getting a, another shot on the second line, at least in the practice today, makes a lot of sense. But And yeah, I think I with Huberto think... coming back from an injury, you want to limit his minutes against LA. Yeah, and plus, um, how would you say Michael Backlund is used to being able to play with high end players and be a good foil for them. And, uh, you know, it, it's one of those where Huberdo has struggled with the Lindholm to Foley line. And I think just allowing Huberdo to ease himself back in the lineup and gain a little bit of confidence with a player like Backlund, uh, will help him as he moves forward, because you 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 know that Huberdeau's not going to be off uh, the first line for very long. It's just... Um, I don't even know about that. I don't think he'll be out of the top six for very long. Yeah. I could see them very much running with Rujishka Lindholm to Foley as the first line, even for the remainder of the month. But then having Huberdeau, Kadri, and whoever they want there, whether that's Mangiapane, Lucic... Dubé, whoever they want there as the second line. Yeah. And I think that spreads your depth out. It's not necessarily what I think we'll see at the end of the season or in the playoffs, but with Rajishka hot, I think you run him on the first line for now. Yeah. But I, I, I don't think Huberto at eight million a year is your third line left wing. Yeah. Well, um I frankly like Huberto, I was uh like it moving him up. Uh, I kind of assume that like the line that he's on uh, is like the quote unquote first line whether he's on okay. the quote unquote second line or you know but even then like i don't with think you Kadri can move Kadri to the third line yeah like Kadri and Mangiapane i think are going to be Huberdo's likely line mates i think you're right and yeah but you know even Mangiapane is struggling right now so right now i look at that kind of as a pairing of Huberdo Kadri yeah. and whoever steps up there whether that's Mangiapane whether that's Coleman Dubé um, Lucic, like I think that you're gonna see Huberto and Kadri put together for a little while, and yeah. I can see the the right wing spot rotating there. Well, uh, Manjapane in the game against Winnipeg looked a lot more like the player that we were used to last year. So hopefully, if he can get himself going, yeah. yeah, he he looks more like he's getting himself into positions to take the types of shots that he did last year and scored on. And he's looking more like a player who just needs a good bounce to go his way, and then he'll be off on a tear. So uh, we'll see. I, I, you know, like I've heard a lot of people complaining about both Dubé and Manjapane and saying like, oh, they're fourth line guys that had a fluke year last year. And it's like, no, they're actually really good, the pair of them. They're just really snake bit 
for whatever reason. And, like, at times, both of them last year struggled for a good portion of the season and then got on heaters for a long time. So, you know, um, like, Manjapane last year started off the season red hot and then, frankly, was mediocre from, like, December through February and then turned it on again at the end of the season. And uh, Dubé didn't really turn it on until uh, March, so... Yeah, you know, we'll see. Yeah, I don't know if I'd say they're both really good. I think that Manjapani is a is a top six forward. I think Dubé is a very generic bottom six guy. Yeah. Uh, well, I he's I he's think a good he, player, but yeah, I, I think there's more to Dubé than just being like a version of Michael Backlund. But we we've said that for years, and he hasn't shown it. Yeah, and, and like last year at the end of the year we started to, and then like whatever iteration that of Dubé that was hasn't really shown up again since this year. Uh, but like he was a little wrecking ball who could score as as well, and like we haven't really seen him engaging physically like he did towards the end of last year either. So uh, we'll see how like as the season progresses whether or not he can engage more. Um, frankly, just generally, whether it's hitting or scoring. And, you know, I just I just think that there's more there with Dubé than what we've seen. I think there could be, but, uh, you know, there's always guys in the league who have more potential. And, and at yeah. some point, they've got to show that potential. And that's where I'm at with Dubé is I think, yeah, the potential's there. But I think sort of like Rajichko, you know, he's he's inconsistent. And you can only last in this league on your potential so long. Yeah, I agree. And it's one of those things, like a a player that he reminds me of quite a bit of is Andrew Cogliano, where like there's some skill there and speed and physicality, but like Cogliano never really, like he had a couple of seasons where offense was there, but like overall. And I think Dubé is a serviceable NHLer. I just don't oh, yeah. know that. You know, on a on a contending team, he's a guy in your top six. No, uh, I think that he's more or less like a high end third line guy uh, around the league, regardless of uh, what team he's on. And talking about Dubé, if we look at these practice lines, he was centering a line. It looks like with Coleman and Richie. I don't know that you move Dubé to center at this point. Rooney was the extra. I have a feeling they probably wanted Dubé to get some reps, but. I can't see them sitting Rooney out in the LA game. No. Well, I, I, in the same token, like I don't see them sitting uh, Lewis either just because of. Well, and Daryl likes Richie. Like who yeah. do you sit out? I know it, it's kind of tough really. I think Daryl's going to want Lewis in the lineup. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe, maybe Richie man, maybe Richie is banged up or something and needs to sit out. Yeah, um, and then on the back end we had Zadora with D Simone and Mackie as the extra. So you and I talked about this. I wonder if D Simone's the guy who ends up here when Stone comes back. Yeah, well, especially like Mackie, um, like the first goal that Winnipeg scored, like that went. That was a bad defensive positioning on his part that allowed the puck to hit him and deflect in. So it's one of those that, like, even though, like, he's continuing to play, like, there's still gaps in Mackey's game where, you know, like, having another player might not be the worst option. And, you know, having D. Simone practice with Zadorov makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think you're right. And and I still think that, you know, we saw Mackey playing this week out of necessity, but I think that his time, and we talked about this last week, I still think his time as a flame is short-lived. Mm-hmm. Well, Matt, uh, that pretty much wraps up everything I want to talk about. Anything else you want to chat about this week, Flames Wise? Uh, not really. Um, like it, it's more just going to be interesting to see how the Flames respond, especially on the six-game road trip. Like there are no real passengers on the six games that they're playing. Um, like all the teams are going to be tough. Um, uh, whether it's Washington, uh, Philadelphia, Florida. Tampa like they're all dynamite so Flames have to be on their game again once uh, they go on the road and hopefully the, these uh, struggles that they've been having to start the year can quickly dissipate and they can start 
putting together another handful of wins. Well, you won the prediction game last week. You thought we'd win against Winnipeg, and that was it. So it's 2-1 to one now in favor of me. I got to build up this lead. But you mentioned the road trip. Before we get there, we've got a home game. And uh, Monday night, this is a weird one for Flames fans, 6.30 start. So make sure your your dinner's done and you're ready to go for that one in the Sal Dome against the LA Kings. And then they go back on the road. And Thursday night, a, a 5 p.m. Calgary starts. So you get your work excuses ready um, in Tampa Bay. And then a matinee game, our first of the year, 2 p.m. in Florida on Saturday. So, Matt, three games. What are you predicting for this one? Um, I'm going to say uh, win, a loss, and a win. So then they win L.A., they lose Tampa, and they win in Florida. Florida. Yeah. Why do you think that? Uh, I think that, um, like the the L.A. game, I think the Flames will get up for it, uh, especially it being a divisional opponent, um, and you know, like wanting to like the importance of it being a four point game. I think the Flames will be more present uh tampa bay is still tampa bay like they're uh, they're a very good team yeah like even if they're struggling right now it's like yeah who cares about the standings they're still dynamite so and florida i think everybody wants to stick it to kachuk so i think that there'll be uh a bit of an attitude of like like just go beat the crap out of the panthers I think they're going to win against L.A. I think they'll lose to Tampa, but I'm going to go with a different result on Saturday. The Flames never do well in matinee games, and I think... I know what you're saying about Florida, but it's also in Florida's barn, and I think that's going to maybe sway the the tide a little bit towards the Panthers. So I'm going to say the Flames beat L.A. and lose the other two. Yeah. Not what I want to happen, but that's what my gut's yeah. telling me. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if... You know, the Flames went 0-3 or 1-2 and in the same way that you described. Um, you know, like, the quality of the Flames' opponents has just been brutal uh, to start the year. And, like, it's hard when you're trying to get your own house in order and you're having to play, like, the best of the best of the best of the best continually. Like... Like but at the same time, if you want to be a playoff team, you got to play the best. Oh, I know. And it's a good workout. It's just... Uh, you know, when you're trying to get everything in your house in order and, like, you're literally playing a playoff team from our division last year, uh, the reigning Eastern Conference champions and the President's Trophy winner, like, that's a lot <laughs> to deal with instead of, like, oh, this team's rebuilding, you know, or in the Bedard sweepstakes, you know, it's just, you know, not as yeah. easy. No, but you got. If you want to go far, you got to beat the best. True. So we'll see, and I think this road trip is gonna. We're gonna see them against some good teams, as you mentioned, and I think this is really gonna show what this team's got. I'm hoping that they, even in those two games, if they lose, I think we're gonna see as we did even during this losing streak some good competitive Flames hockey. Yep. Well, I, I, how would you say? I would expect the Flames to basically play the Flames game throughout all three games. It's just whether or not they can get enough bounces to go in. And I think even more than enough bounces, can they put together 60 minutes? And we really haven't seen that yet. And I think on this road trip, they're going to have to start stringing together 60-minute hockey to win. I agree. Where do you put Vlar this week, if anywhere? Uh, nowhere, frankly. Uh, I, there's enough of a break uh, between the, the LA game and the Tampa Bay game. Um, I'd I'd leave it until the Flyers game next week. Do you give them two next week, or do you just pretend that you didn't say you were going to put them in every week and play them in the Flyers game? Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> like that's that's thing, right? Daryl said he's going to try and play them every week, and then there's weeks you don't want to play them. So it's like, do you just forget you said that? Well, next week, uh, the Flames play three really good opponents and the Flyers, so I'm assuming that Vladar gets the Flyers game. Um, but, yeah, I think that the four after that, where it's the Penguins, Capitals, Hurricanes, and Panthers again, you're pretty much stuck with Markstrom in that, and then uh, Vladar gets the Montreal game on December 1st, and, 
Then I, after I, under, that, I understand what Daryl is trying to say, and I think it's admirable that he wants to play him more, but saying you're going to play him once a week, you've kind of shot yourself in the foot now if you don't. Yeah, well, it's one of those where, like, in December, things ease up, because, like, they play uh, Montreal, which is mediocre, then Washington, then Arizona, who's bad, Minnesota, who's good, Columbus, who's bad, Toronto, who's good ish Montreal again who's bad Vancouver who's bad you know like there's enough mediocre teams that you can throw like a, a higher preponderance of starts especially with it being every other day in December um it's just there's a lot of really dynamite teams in the next two weeks and it, it's just bad timing really um I I would expect Vladar's um workload will increase as the games and as this team starts to dig themselves out of their hole yeah because you pretty much are stuck uh, until the flames get a bit of a cushion uh going with your best goalie and that that is markstrom so we'll see i agree yeah all right matt well we will talk to you next week when hopefully the flames haven't started another losing streak yes and that would be ideal as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.